Penman equation forms the basis for many combination methods to estimate evapotranspiration. In this clip, we will guide you through the derivation of the Penman equation. Following those steps will also help us to properly interpret the different parts of the equation. The idea of combination methods is that they provide information about the surface fluxes of sensible and latent heat flux by combining the concept of the surface energy balance with what we have learned about turbulent transport. Whereas in the Bowen ratio method we use the observations at two heights, in the case of the Penman equation we move the lower level to the surface. And subsequently we eliminate this lower level altogether, leaving us with a method that needs single level observations only. So let's first define the situation that we are considering. We take a surface that is wet, so water can evaporate unrestricted. Next, what are the observations that we have available? First, we have single level observations of temperature, humidity, in terms of vapor pressure and wind speed. These observations cover what we need in terms of turbulent transport. Furthermore, we have net radiation and solid flux as input related to the surface energy balance. Note, however, that the surface solid flux should actually be interpreted more generically. It is the change in heat storage of the material below the surface. That material could be a water body, a shallow or a deep lake, or a thin water layer on top of the soil. Coming back to the exact conditions that we look at, if the surface is wet and air and water surface are in equilibrium, the air just above the surface is saturated with water vapor. So if we would know the temperature of the water, the surface temperature, we actually would know the amount of water vapor in the air. But with single level observations, we do not know the surface temperature nor the surface moisture content. So now we have set the scene, it is time to summarize our plan. What we are aiming for is an estimate of the latent heat flux from the surface based on single level observations only. The challenge is that we don't know anything about what happens at the surface, except that the air is saturated with water vapor. What we do have are resistance expressions for both the sensible and latent heat flux and the energy balance equation. Those ingredients are identical to what we use for the bone ratio method. To solve this set of three equations without having to iterate, we have to pull a trick. We estimate the surface temperature based on the air temperature by linearizing the saturated vapor pressure function. To reduce the complexity of the following derivation, we assume the aerodynamic resistance to be known. So we leave any considerations about the turbulence production, stability, and hence also the wind speed, we leave that out for the moment. Furthermore, we assume, as is commonly done, that the resistances for moisture and heat transport are the same. So let's start with the resistance expression for the sensible heat flux. Since we are using observations close to the surface, the height difference is sufficiently small that we can ignore the difference between potential temperature and normal temperature. This assumption is not an essential ingredient for the Penman method, but we make it to end up with an expression that is similar to what is often found in literature. So in the expression, two temperatures are involved, the air temperature and the surface temperature. Likewise, we use the resistance expression for the latent heat flux. Again, we slightly change variables to later obtain an expression that is close to what is commonly used. And again, this change is not essential in the derivation. What we do is the following. We replace specific humidity by water vapor pressure. This introduces some extra variables, that is, the specific gas constants for dry air and water vapor, as well as pressure. In the resulting expression, two vapor pressures are involved, the vapor pressure in the air and the vapor pressure at the surface. To simplify things, a number of parameters are combined in a single psychrometer constant. But note that this constant is far from being constant, as it is directly depending on pressure. The latent heat of vaporization depends on temperature, 
and the specific heat depends on the moisture content. Yet, we tend to call this thing a constant. With the use of the psychrometer constant, the resistance expression for the latent heat flux simplifies somewhat. With this new expression, we go to the next step, to eliminate the vapor pressure at the surface. And we recall that above a wet surface, the air close to the surface is saturated. So we can replace the surface vapor pressure by the saturated vapor pressure at a temperature equal to the surface temperature. All the steps that we made until now result in a set of three equations. The two flux expressions plus the surface energy balance. If we add the net radiation and solid flux to the observations of air temperature and humidity, the result is a set of three equations with three unknowns. In principle, this system of equations can be solved. However, this cannot be done explicitly since the saturation vapor pressure function is nonlinear. So although we are ready in principle, we are not yet ready in practice. To obtain a practical explicit expression for the latent heat flux, we have to move on. To get rid of the iteration, we need to remove the nonlinearity. What we do have is the air temperature. And with that, also the saturated vapor pressure at the air temperature. This value will be close to the saturated vapor pressure at surface temperature, but it's not yet good enough. However, we are able to make a reasonable estimate of the surface vapor pressure. Let's draw a tangent to the saturated vapor pressure function at the point that we know at the air temperature. Now we move along the tangent towards the surface temperature. Where the tangent reaches the surface temperature, the corresponding saturated vapor pressure will be a better estimate of the surface vapor pressure. So our estimate of the saturated vapor pressure at the surface consists of the first order estimate, the saturated vapor pressure at air temperature, plus a linearized correction. In this linearization, we use the slope of the saturated vapor pressure function, S, which is simply the first derivative of that function. What we obtain is not the real surface vapor pressure, but a pretty good estimate. Now, why did we make this complicated step? Well, because we needed the saturated vapor pressure at the surface temperature to determine the latent heat flux. So now let's substitute our estimate in that expression. This looks all very nice, but it's quite lengthy. And with this step, we've introduced a new problem. We still have an unknown on the right hand side. The unknown surface temperature is still there. After the linearization step, we now need to finally get rid of the surface temperature. What we will use for this is the resistance expression for the sensible heat flux. We rewrite this in such a way that we get an expression for the temperature difference between air and surface. The same temperature difference that is present and also annoying us in the expression for the late heat flux. When we substitute this into our expression for the latent heat flux, we get rid of the surface temperature, but in turn we now have the unknown sensible heat flux on the right hand side of the equation. So again, we shift the problem without really solving it. Yet at this stage, we already see two separate parts in the equation for the latent heat flux, so let's have a look at this. The first one is related to the dryness of the air. The latent heat flux increases if the difference between actual vapor pressure and saturated vapor pressure increases. You could interpret this as the atmospheric demand for water vapor. The second term is best interpreted when we look at where it came from. It is directly related to the temperature difference between surface and air. So it indicates the part of evapotranspiration that is related to the fact that some energy supply has heated up the surface above a temperature that is equal to the air temperature. Our final step to arrive at an explicit expression for the late heat flux will be finally successful 
we will use the surface energy balance to get rid of the sense of heat flux at the right hand side. The surface energy balance gives us an expression for the sense of heat flux. This one we then can substitute in the expression for the latent heat flux. That was the expression we arrived at earlier. Then we have to rearrange things. In particular, we need to get rid of the unknown latent heat flux that now popped up on the right hand side. We do this by moving it to the left hand side. This leaves us with a right hand side that is completely determined by things that we know, that is, things that we observed. Again, we can interpret the different terms as a term that is related to the dryness of the air, a term that is related to the heating of the surface by radiation, and now also a factor on the left hand side. That term indicates that evaporation cools the surface and as such it counteracts the effect of heating up the surface by radiation. Now we only need a little bit of rearranging to obtain an explicit equation for the latent heat flux. In the denominator we find the factor S, which was related to the cooling effect of evaporation on the surface. In the rearrangement steps we implicitly used a few steps that may not be directly obvious. Furthermore, please realize that from now on we will use the S as a shortened way to write down the slope of the saturated vapor pressure function. So actually it's a function, but we just use the symbol S. The result of all of our efforts is the Penman equation, in which we again discern two terms. The first term is the so-called energy term, which we interpret as the term that indicates the effect of surface being warmer than the atmosphere. And the second term is related to the dryness of the air, or the atmospheric demand. Together these two terms nicely summarize why drying your laundry outside works best on days that are both sunny, warm and windy. The energy input from the sun makes your laundry warmer than the surrounding air hence increasing the energy term. Furthermore, on a warm sunny day, the higher air temperature also makes the saturated vapor pressure is higher. This helps for the aerodynamic term. And finally, on a windy day, the aerodynamic resistance is small, which again favors the aerodynamic term. So, what do these terms depend on? Well, the energy term depends primarily on the available energy. Furthermore, temperature has an effect through the slope of the saturated vapor pressure function. The aerodynamic term primarily depends on the difference between saturated vapor pressure and actual vapor pressure. This difference is also called the vapor pressure deficit. Well, and furthermore, wind speed, stability and roughness affect the aerodynamic resistance. Now it is time for some final notes. Let's first focus on some limitations of the Penman equation. First, we prescribe the aerodynamic resistance to keep the derivation simple, but in reality, the aerodynamic resistance depends in part on the outcome of the same computation. The magnitude of the resulting buoyancy flux will determine stability, and through that, the aerodynamic resistance. Likewise, we prescribe the available energy. However, both net radiation and solid flux depend on the surface temperature that would be the outcome of that same computation of the surface energy balance. So the Penman equation is a proper way to describe the latent heat flux from a wet surface, but it has its limitations where it comes to predicting that latent heat flux. And then some final remarks about interpretation of the Penman equation. Since the Penman equation is based on the surface energy balance, we will get the sensible heat flux for free. The Penman equation also gives us some insight in the temperature dependence of evaporation. The main effect is related to the dependence of the saturated vapor pressure on temperature, and hence on the vapor pressure deficit. And furthermore, the temperature dependence of the slope of the saturated vapor pressure function makes evaporation increase with temperature as well. To get a feel for that relative importance of S and gamma, the psychrometer constant is gamma, in the denominator, S equals gamma at around 6 degrees Celsius, and S is larger than gamma for temperatures above that. 
a way to more clearly see the temperature effect on the aerodynamic term is to rewrite the term using the relative humidity. This shows that at equal relative humidity, the aerodynamic term increases with increasing temperature through the increase of the saturated vapor pressure. So to conclude, in this clip we have shown how the Penman equation is a combination method combining the energy balance equation with knowledge about turbulent transport. The nice aspect of the Penman equation is that it provides an estimate of evaporation based on single level observations only. The derivation of the Penman equation was quite lengthy, but apart from the mathematical details, there are a number of main steps and assumptions. And finally, it is important to realize that the Penman equation is a descriptive expression, and when you want to use it in a predictive way, you should be aware that the, of the fact that some of the input variables in turn are dependent on the outcome of the computation. Yet the Penman equation, and more generally the methods of how it was derived, is a useful concept that also has been extended to other surfaces than the simple wet surface we have considered here. The extension to vegetated surfaces, the so-called Penman-Monteith equation, is an important example of this extension of the concept.